I think at the end of the day, they're buying from Sean. They're buying from Brendan. If you're Deloitte and you have that brand, it's different. But for boutique firms, they're buying from you. And so let's inject your personality into this a little bit and like figure out what the event is. Like the company has a brand and you don't want to do things that violate that brand. But within that, you have a wide degree of latitude to inject your personality. You're listening to RowUp's Champions, a podcast created for B2B leaders to help you align your people, streamline your processes, trust your data, and leverage technology in order to grow your business. We're your hosts, Brendan Denewell, CEO and co-founder of Dynamico. And Amy Weaver, Dynamico's marketing director. Consulting firms, professional services firms, scale better than others Mm. when they seemingly have all the same resources. Yeah. So let's just take a 250 person firm. Mm -hmm. So they have the same number of, same headcount. They seem to have the same resources as far as whether it's investment or capital or whatever. They seem to have the same tech and tools. Yeah. So why are some of those, you know, scaling more effectively than others? Mm -hmm. Do you have any insight into that? Well, I mean, you know, like, so there's the people process technology piece, right? So you said like, and I think that, you know, on the technology side, they might have the same tools and it's a really a function of, are they actually leveraging them Mm -hmm. and to what degree they're leveraging them? Yeah. On the process side, I mean, I think it's some of the stuff that we've talked about in terms of, you know, there's that idea, I think Bain came out with this around the, the idea of like sales plays. So like when a buying window surfaces, somebody changes jobs or, you know, they make a strategic hire or they just make an acquisition or something like that. Like those represent for certain types of firms, you know, buying opportunities. And so how do you in a systematic coordinated way, organize a bunch of people to try to attack that opportunity and, you know, in a way that's thoughtful and, you know, all that kind of thing, but that's a process thing. How do you do cross sells, you know, like in a lot of cases, if you're in a larger firm and you have multiple service lines, they're not even aware of what the other groups do. And so, or not sufficiently. And so like, how do you develop a process to educate that partner or managing director that might be selling one particular offering into the CFO's office, but have them realize that, Hey, there are five or six other things that we also sell these are when those kinds of things are most relevant. These are what those buying windows look like. These are the questions you should be asking or the statements from the client you should be listening to that signal that they might be a good candidate for something like that. These are the types of, you know, based on our data, this type of engagement tends to lead to these kinds of engagements as follow on work. Like that's, that's all process stuff. Uh And then there's the people piece, which is like, do they have domain expertise, usually they do. But then there's also the soft part of it of like, what's their, how curious are they? How do they think transactionally? Or do they think, you know, do they invest in long term relationships? Do they want to be a trusted advisor who earns that respect and that trust over time? And they recognize how how easy it is to erode that trust by trying to microwave results? Or are they mercenaries? You know, there's, there's that piece too. So, Mm -hmm. and I think, you know, like with the process stuff and they're all kind of related, right? So it's like, and getting the, I am a big believer that tactics matter. And so like when people say, Hey, we tried a sales enablement initiative and it didn't work. It's like, well, what do you mean? It didn't work. Like, what about it didn't work? Let's break down the pieces of that. Mm -hmm. It could be that the marketing team was creating tools that didn't necessarily map to the buyer journey. You know, they were operating inside of a silo rather than working with the business development folks, the revenue folks to kind of map that journey for the client and making sure that they have relevant messages at relevant times. Like that could have been the breakdown. Mm -hmm. Then the partner is forced to try to pull from old or missing, like they have to cobble together the marketing tools that they do have and they're not necessarily hyper relevant. So like that's a tactical thing or hey, we want to get, we want to increase awareness. You know, one of the things I talk a lot about is writing, I'm a big believer in like writing short form on LinkedIn for partners, managing directors. And the reason is, especially with boutique firms, they usually don't have the expertise or the firepower to execute an organic search strategy. And so when they say, we're going to write long form content on our website, 
it implies that people are going to their website and people aren't. The people that are going to their website are people who already know them. And so what they're doing is they're spending a lot of time and energy writing great stuff that nobody sees. And so instead, like, let's realize, hey, this partner, this managing director, they have their 500 followers or whatever it is. They don't need to be um, an influencer. I call it like being slightly famous. Like they just need to have their little pool of like 500 people or a thousand people or whatever it is, but they're the right thousand people and share their stuff. And I think LinkedIn is optimal for doing that, but that's a tactical decision. And even within that, like, all right, if I assume that I want to do that, there are, there are techniques that make it more likely that LinkedIn will be effective for you. Like the way that you craft your bio, the way that you write the first sentence of a post to attract someone's attention that will get them to want to read the rest of it, you know, using shorter paragraphs. Like these are all very, very hyper tactical decisions that require good, you know, again, like good training on how to do that stuff. Because otherwise they'll say, hey, I did LinkedIn. I did LinkedIn and it didn't work. And it's like, okay, well, let's look at what you did. You wrote one post every three months that was a pat on the back of like, I'm humbled and honored to win whatever. It's always like very self-aggrandizing. Mm -hmm. You're not sharing anything actually useful. You write these massive like single page blocks that, like and make you make people's eyes bleed. Like you just think about how you consume it. And, you know, and it's stuff that sometimes like their English teacher might bristle at it, but, you know, we know it is more effective. And so it's like, when you say it didn't work, what do you mean? You know, so hmm. I don't know. I don't know if that answers that or not. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I mean, I love, I love where you took that. And also the fact that you, you know, you went right to, you know, the people process and technology, and then you added the data later. But, you know, we typically have to put the data between process and technology. But I like the way you sort of, I mean, these things are not linear in which whatever way we do that they're not linear, right? They're a sort of ball of, you know, five or six different threads of different colors, which is, you know, like when you start anything, that's what it looks like. And then when you look back, it's these nice six lines of different colored thread that all somehow work out, right? Something I actually saw on LinkedIn yesterday, which I thought was a really good visual to your point. I also like the way you talked about, you know, I was thinking a lot of the things you were talking about that you were saying were tactics and how tactics matter. I think the way you broke those down was actually very strategic. Mm. So the way you connect, you know, strategic planning, essentially. And when I say strategic planning, I don't mean like, how do you plan the year? It's like weekly strategic planning, because I think that's how you broke down when someone says, we tried this and it didn't work. It's a tactical thing, but the way you figured out what, why it didn't work was actually mm -hmm. very strategic mm -hmm. because you're digging down into what is the core, you know, what is the root cause of it not working? Yeah. So let's change that and, and try it again. You know? Yeah. And I totally agree with you on the, on the LinkedIn versus website content thing too. When we spoke previously, you talked about like a top five or a top 15 or something like that and how you tried to, you know, reach out to people on some yeah. sort of yeah. regular basis. Can we mm -hmm. go through that again and like what the thought process is? Yeah. So I, ha I have a friend who showed this to me years ago and he had a spreadsheet and it has five names on it, 25 names on it, 150 names on it. And he reaches out to the five names multiple times a week, the 25 names weekly, the 150 names monthly. And he's in a line of business that's a very people heavy thing. And he's a very, very disciplined person. I've never, I've never been able to fully replicate the pace of that. Yeah. So I shoot for five weekly, 25 monthly and 150 quarterly. But the thing that I really, this so obviously there's like the discipline piece of that. And, you know, he uses a spreadsheet. I think for many people like CRM is a more effective more robust kind of mechanism for that. We would agree. Yeah. But the nuance that I really liked about it was the five are not the people that are in a buying window in his case, or like he thinks are the hottest leads. The five are the people who have an acute need that he can help serve them. And so that could be, I'm about to raise money. It could be, I need to hire a CFO. It could be I just got a new job and I'm trying to get integrated in my first 90 days and I'm underwater and I don't know what to do. It could be I just lost my job. It could be even personal stuff like I just had a kid or I just got a cancer scare and I need to find like the best specialist for whatever. But there are five people in his network that he's like, I'm going to make a material investment in these people over the next month or so to try to just go completely above and beyond to help them. And I'm not going to ask for anything in return. It's just like, and, you know, he is a long-term relationship thinker. And the only way this works is if you 
think that way. And if it's not like, hey, now I did this for you. I helped you out with your whole cancer thing. Why don't you send me some leads? You know, like that doesn't, that's not, you're not going to stick with it. And people can smell that, right? But he trusts that over a year, he's going to make this material investment in 20 people, 25 people, whatever it is. And over 10 years, 20 years or whatever, he's got this pool of people who would, you know, step in front of a train for him because of that. And so I loved it. And I've tried to model it as best I can. You know, again, like he's a robot, but um, it just was so impressive to me in it. It turns networking or whatever you want to call it, networking, business development, whatever it is from this transactional me focused thing into something that I feel like is just much more life giving and makes my work so much more enjoyable. And it requires a leap of faith, right? It requires that like, I believe I am not doing this because I have a revenue target, but I trust that if I do this, I'll hit my revenue target and it'll happen in ways that I don't entirely know or understand or fully appreciate. And it doesn't mean that you don't do the other stuff. It doesn't mean that you're not sharing thought leadership. It doesn't mean that when someone, a buying window does present itself, that you aren't disciplined about trying to nurture that relationship or move them through the buyer's journey. It doesn't mean any of that kind of stuff. But in addition to that, Mm -hmm. you know, there are people who are people who might become potential clients that I do that for because 10 years down the road, there might be a buying opportunity. There are people who aren't even ideal buyers who might know ideal buyers. Because I think that's the other thing that people don't realize when they think about referral. I think everybody assumes that the one source of referral is people who I've worked with, who I did good work for, who then refer me to other people like them. But there's a much bigger pool of referrals that are people who just know what I do and think that it's interesting and they like me as a person and I went way above and beyond to help them at some point in their lives. And then a friend of theirs, they're playing golf or whatever, and a friend of theirs mentions that they're trying to find someone. So they're like, oh, you need to talk to, to Jake, right? Because, you know, that is an indirect source of referral that I think is a lot harder to, it's much harder to like systematize, which is why I think people don't think about it as much. Mm-hmm. You're going to be less inclined, like certainly like in your, in your company's CRM, you're probably not going to put... Bobby the dentist in there. But that doesn't mean that you don't help Bobby the dentist because Bobby the dentist might know a CFO who might become a client someday. And so, so anyway, but it's just a, it's a different way of thinking about it. It's long-term, it's service oriented. Well, it's long-term and it may be more essential now than ever when people have all the information that they need at their fingertips to make a buying decision. So you have to have that extra element, don't you? There's got to be some secret sauce beyond the traditional playbook, I guess, yeah. if you will. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. And I just think it makes your job more fun. Right. I mean, it's a way to integrate your life and your work in a way that I think is really compelling, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. And go, you know, that whole idea of, you know, how, in my mind, how things switched, whatever it was, 10 years ago from always be selling to always be helping. Mm. I think it's more of a, you know, it's how we move from the 20th century into the 21st century. It's absolutely more about relationships. And I think you talked a little about, you know, your friend's version of Dunbar's number that you've kind of adopted as well, which, you know, so Dunbar's number was all about, or is all about no human, I mean, there might be a few exceptions, can handle more than 150 relationships, right? in a meaningful, helpful way. Yeah. So why do all this crazy activity to try and reach a thousand people or 5,000 people or, or even 500 people? Because you're not going to be able to impact them. If you can, great. Mm-hmm. But focus on, you know, whether it's 5, 15, 35, 50, 150, or yeah. 5, 25, 100, whatever the numbers are, realize that you're going to kind of tap out at around 150. And I think the friend that you talked about I think hundred a hundred makes a pretty good makes a lot of sense too because a hundred people can really have a massive impact on your on your life. Yeah. Well, and it's like a muscle, right? So it's like if I'm just if it's for people that are like, oh, that just sounds really daunting. It's like start with two, five, ten. Like you know, like you don't have to you don't have to start with the whole thing. You'll get there over time. I bet he didn't start with those numbers. So yeah, and I do think you know, I mean, for people that are in business development roles, like if you extend beyond the 150 number, like the only way you can do that, I think is with 
CRM. And so, but it's both. So again, you know, it's like, I think so many people, I think so many people use CRM really just as like a, it's like a CYA thing, or it's like that managing director has these accounts, but then they go leave to go to another firm and we don't want to lose those relationships. Or I want to make sure that we have clear lines between who owns what account. Like it's, it's not, those things might be necessary, but they're insufficient. And so it's like the next level up is like, how do I use this to do my job better? And so like, that's where I think a lot of the sales enablement things come into play. And I think there are a lot of organizations are getting smarter about that and they're getting better about how do we use this to make sure that we're moving people through a funnel or whatever. But I think the top layer of it is like all this kind of all this stuff that we're talking about, which just, again, it requires the discipline to like write that stuff down on a date or carving out 15 or 20 minutes a day to reflect on the conversations that you had today and go in there and enter your notes and like so-and-so just had a kid and they're worried about going back to work and they're hoping they can find a nanny. So I'm going to try and like tap my network and try to find them some leads for that, right? Like it's that kind of stuff Or like so-and-so went to the University of Clemson and they're super into it. And so I'm going to make a note in there so that the next time I'm down there, I, you know, grab a sweatshirt or something and just drop it in the mail for them. It's like, it's that layer that I think the number of organizations and the number of people that do it is a very, very small percentage. But the other thing I like about it is that it doesn't necessarily need to be, this doesn't have to be something that an organization mandates and it doesn't have to be something that requires a lot of coordination with marketing and business development and, you know, the revenue office or whatever. It's like, you could be one partner, one managing director who decides to take this seriously and you can do it yourself. Like you don't need permission to do this. And you have the technology, most likely some version of it in your firm already. And so like, there's nothing stopping you from doing this. Yeah. But also I think it reinforces, and of course, you know, we're acutely aware of this because, you know, ultimately our audience sees us as a technology solution because we implement their CRM, but we're very well aware that technology comes last, right? Mm. It is. It's people, process, data, and technology in that order for a reason. Ultimately, once it's all set up, then it all you know becomes that ball of different threads of wool. But without the the people part, covers the mindset, the culture, the core values, the principles, whatever those things are. That layer. Yeah, that'll first of all attract people to work inside that business, and then attract people to want to partner with that business. Mm-hmm. Then. So that makes our work a lot easier, especially if then they have their processes, you know, fairly well dialed in Mm -hmm. and they know what what data they're tracking from a marketing perspective, from a sales perspective, from a customer service and success perspective, because ultimately the technology is is only implemented to make all that stuff, you know, better and faster and more valuable and to be able to do it at a little more scale and to not lose super valuable information, you know, if people do leave for whatever reason. And so our jobs from an implementation perspective of the CRM is so much easier when all that stuff is is really dialed in, starting with the people. Yep. But of course, in, in most cases, we have to do a little bit of work before we, we actually start implementing the CRM to make sure that the processes are good and that they are tracking the right data. On this show, in other episodes, we'll talk a lot about the data component, but those things are all much easier for us to be successful and therefore our our client to be more successful because the technology just is the final component to make it all sort of, you know, as some might say, throw gas on the fire kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I really like that. So I guess one of the other things that, you know, as you were talking, I'm sure a lot of people are thinking for whatever reason, you know, Urgency always seems to be the enemy in these types of situations where anybody, you know, listening or watching this is thinking, this makes total sense, but I have a quota or I have some sort of target that I need to reach by the end of the month or the end of the quarter or the end of the year. And that's obviously, and it almost feel, I think it feels to a lot of people like that is the enemy of, of getting this right, which comes back to what we were saying earlier about just make the time, you know, you'll get better over time. So after the first 10 calls, you might need a half an hour to kind of do this correctly. And then eventually you'll get it down to 
five or 10 minutes or less, right? You don't realize when you start doing something like this that you do become more efficient and better at it over time. Yeah. It will take less time. Right. But that's why people don't start it in the first place because they think it's going to take a half an hour every single time. And it just, that seems like a lot of time and not worth it, you know? Yeah. But, and then it's like, instead of what, you know, like that's where I, <laughs> you know, it's What's sort of the like, alternative? well, yeah. And it's sort of, again, it's, do I think that microwaving it can work? Maybe, but I feel like it, I feel like there's a cost and there's a reason why I'm sure you guys get pitched this too. Like these lead gen firms, they show up in your, it's usually like a LinkedIn and mail. And it's like, Hey, we're going to do cold prospecting for you to get more leads to build up your pipeline. And it's some 25 year old kid because they need that to have the business model work. And they're very aggressive and they take the page from like the B2B SaaS playbook where it's like quick question subject line because they know that quick question is like the one that gets you to open up the email. And then it's like, you didn't answer my first three emails for one of three reasons. And it's, you know, you know, dot, dot, dot. And it just is, it's hyper aggressive. And I don't think it respects your client. And if I'm like the chief innovation officer at Xerox, I'm not going to have patience for that. Or I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm either going to completely ignore it or, you know, when people talk about it, well, it's a numbers game, it's a numbers game. And it's like, okay, but like, if I'm operating in a pool of 5,000 or 1,000 or 500 potential clients, that's my universe of my population. That approach is going to, you're going to churn through that list really quickly. Mm -hmm. And you're going to harass that list really, really quickly. And so for the 1% that raise their hand and say, I'm interested because you got to hit a short-term number, I am consciously or unconsciously planting messages in the brains of the 95% who aren't in that buying window that I don't respect their time, that I'm a very transactional type of, cons like it's not signaling trusted advisor to me. And so when I think about these kinds of things, it's like, I'm, yes, I'm investing in relationships and I'm leading with serving you and adding value with every interaction because I trust that you will come to think of me as a domain expert in an area that might be relevant to you at some point. And I'm going to stay top of mind and I'm going to do it in a way that's respectful. And I'm going to trust that when that buying window emerges, you're going to raise your hand or by being consistent and continually to showing up, you know, for you in ways that add value every time, I'll be the first person you think of. I shared that a couple of weeks ago. Like, there was a Bain study that like when a buying window emerges, some crazy number, like 72% of people, they pick up the phone and they just call the first person that comes to mind. And so like, how do you be the first person that comes to mind? It's by staying in touch with them over a long period of time, sharing value consistently. So there's a sense in which I think about that, like when we talk about like quotas, it's like today's interactions are next year's pipeline you know? And so it's like, I'm making an investment in next year's revenue target. And it makes sense. Like when a firm hires a managing director or a partner from another firm, usually that partner is conflicted out from like, they can't just bring all their clients with them. Right. And so they give them a ramp up period because they're like, we understand you're starting from zero. You're going to need to kind of build up new relationships and kind of cultivate that stuff. And that's just going to take time. And firms recognize that when they bring that person in. So as a partner managing director, like that's always true. So it's like, if you haven't done any of this stuff, you should assume it's going to take you 12 to 18 months to see fruit from it. <laughs> it's kind of like, I follow these people that do like calisthenics and in, on Instagram, like they do like the crazy gymnastics -y kind of moves. I find that very inspiring, but I've never been willing, like they, they're like, this is a five-year process for you to be. And it's the kind of thing, like my wife, my wife has been working on her handstand. She can do a 12 second handstand now. That took her two years. So it's so incremental <laughs> and you have to be so patient. But it's like, if I wait a year and I don't do the things that are necessary, I'm going to end up being exactly in the same place that I am today. You know, so it's just like, yes, I think it's long term. Yes, I think this is the best way to do it. The answer to like, I can't, I don't think I have a good answer to the, oh, but I got to hit my quota next month. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're going to have to have a hard conversation with your boss start the activities now so that you don't have to have that hard conversation again a year from now, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sean, I just, there was one question that I wanted to come back to, and that was, do you see, because you work with both entrepreneurial consulting businesses, as well as, I'm guessing, public or whether it's private equity or whatever, do you see a difference in how this is done in an entrepreneurial situation or a more corporate situation? 
I think the biggest difference is the larger the firm, the more likely it is that they have resources that can theoretically be deployed to make this easier and more effective. So when you're a small, you know, solo practitioner, or maybe you've got three or four partners, you're the marketing department, <laughs> you're RevOps, you're like, every, you're everything. And so that's the hardest part, I think, when you're a smaller firm is how do I do all of this stuff? And that's a lot of like the firm that I was at before I was doing what I'm doing now was an innovation consulting firm. I had two business partners. We had seven managing directors. We had a team of about 70. So we were small, but um, that informed a lot of how I think about this stuff was that experience was like, okay, given our constraints, you know, we would be up against the Deloitte Digitals of the world. And I realized pretty quickly after we lost a couple of deals to them, we can't play their game. And so I was like, well, what game can we play? And it's a scrappier, to your point, it's a more entrepreneurial game. It's a scrappier game. It recognizes the constraints that one has. And that led to a lot of these conclusions. But, you know, my wife's the chief revenue officer at a PE-backed, you know, valuation services firm. And we compare notes all the time. And I don't think there's really a difference in the tactics. It's like, if I can, if one... I've seen these things take my, you know, my managing directors from a pipeline of zero to, you know, managing a five or six million dollar book of business. Like if that works for them, you can also take a hundred partners or managing directors who all have a million dollar book of business. And I think by applying these things over a consistent period of time can grow that to a three or four million dollar book of business or whatever it is, like whatever, you know, whatever the operating model is and whatever their leverage model, there's constraints on that in terms of how on delivery, but I think the tactical applications are the same. I think the pros of being in a larger firm are that you theoretically have more resources you can deploy on it. Now, the caveat on that is that you now have politics that you have to deal with and you have people who think that there's a certain way to do things and you have to get, like if I'm part of why I was able to do all of this, the benefit of the entrepreneurial firm is I didn't have to, anybody, I didn't have to ask for permission. I can just do it. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to move much, much faster and learn much, much faster than I think we otherwise would have so it's sort of like driving a little ship versus steering a big ship. Like it takes longer to steer the big ship and to get everybody aligned. But there's things that you can do within that. I mean, it's like, so let, let's pick a pilot group. Let's find, let's find a group of early adopters inside of the firm. Or if we think that there's a particular channel or vertical that we really want to attack this year, and we're starting from zero with it, right? So we think, oh, we think there's a big opportunity in PE. Let's go after PE. And we're starting from zero. Like that's a great candidate for trying this stuff. Like let's use let's use this as the playbook to try some of these things. Let's document it. Let's see what works and what doesn't. And then we can turn around and either expand from our pilot group of managing directors to a larger pool from this service line, apply it to the other service lines. You know, I think all of that stuff works and can de-risk it, I think, for a firm. You know, and again, I mean, at the end of the day, like the nice thing about it is most firms have a CRM of some kind. So the technology piece is the box is checked there might be some tweaks that they need. Like you might need to create some custom fields or something like that for records. That's really all we're talking about. And then, so 90% of it is getting the team to buy in, why this is beneficial to them, getting them the processes to do it, having the good governance in place to kind of follow up and monitor and make sure that they're doing these things. But yeah, I think that's probably the biggest difference is like resources on the one hand, ability to turn on a dime on the other, you know? Yeah, agility, yeah. I want us to see if I could, if we can maybe take this in a different direction. Yeah. And that is, so I think your overarching response was there's no difference in the tactics that would be used, whether you're entrepreneurial or, or a more corporate, you know, organization. So then where, and you've, you've already answered some of this, but so then where is, where is the difference? If there's no difference in the tactics. Okay. So what you're saying is that the difference is in the resources. Yeah. So like, so from a sales enablement standpoint, if like an entrepreneurial firm is going to have a lot of difficulty creating, like churning out high fidelity, white papers, like that kind of stuff, kind of in a scalable way, that's going to be hard for them to do because they don't have a dedicated marketing department in a lot of cases. And so, which is, you know, when I was saying like that informed a lot of our behavior was like, okay, we can't create Deloitte type content. And then I read Deloitte content and no offense to Deloitte, I feel like they round off all the edges of all the content. And so they write a bunch of stuff without actually saying anything. And Deloitte can get away with it because it's Deloitte. I was like, we're not Deloitte. So what can we do? We're going to give away all of our secrets. We're going to recognize that our proprietary methodology and process is the same as everybody else's. And so we're going to share it liberally and 
educate people about how it works because we trust that they probably aren't in a position to implement it. They're still going to want help. And now we're not having to tell them that we're smart. We're showing them that we're smart by sharing that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a difference. I think when you're in a much larger firm, especially if you're in a firm or in a service line that has a regulatory or a compliance kind of piece to it. So like, you know, financial services of any kind, like if FINRA and all that kind of stuff, like the tactics certainly change because there's a lot of stuff you can't say. And there are much more eyes have to be on every single piece of content. So that that is probably a material difference. When you're a smaller firm, you know, the whole like land and expand strategy is less relevant because you have a few, you, the breadth of service offerings that you have is probably a lot more narrow. And so there's a big tent pole of that, I think in larger firms around cross-sell initiatives, upsell initiatives, things like a strategic accounts program where, you know, we theoretically could do 15 different things for people and we need to have that be coordinated. And so we're going to put a person at the top of that stack that's like the key account manager and then, you know, they're coordinating with everybody and it's much more kind of cohesive. Those kinds of things are, are going to be definitely different and necessary. Yeah. But then it's like, okay, once we've identified that stuff, the day-to-day -day tactical stuff of like, how does the managing director show up today, this week? That's the kind of stuff that I think is not any different. I think it's like, be liberal and generous with your insights, add value for people consistently over a period of time in ways that relate to business and ways that maybe don't. Like not to be a dead horse with that, but like one of the more common objections or things that come up for people in professional services is like, it's a long sales cycle in most cases. And they're like, what in the world do I say with touch point 20? You know, so we're like, oh, use the CRM, and make sure you have the trigger to follow up in a month or every three months or whatever it is. And they're like, I don't know what to say every three months other than like, hey, are you ready to buy yet? And so it's very, this kind of thinking solves that issue too. Because I can, if I get you to connect with me on LinkedIn and I am disciplined and consistent about sharing knowledge on LinkedIn, I am passively putting my face in front of you without me even having to do the touch point thing. We did stuff like we had a newsletter thing where rather than the newsletter be from the company, it was from Jordan. It was from one of our managing directors. And it was in plain text. And it was just from his email. And it was like three or four links to stuff that was interesting that other people had written within his domain of expertise with a couple of sentences of commentary on why he thought that was so interesting. That's a scalable activity. And that's something that, you know, he had his little newsletter list of a couple hundred people or whatever it was. But again, it was the right hundred people. And that's a way to add value. And we even experiment. we did stuff where we like, we experimented where it was like, it started with, that was like an internal, like, because we had like a worth reading channel where we would just share interesting stuff. That was kind of the kernel of it. We were like, I bet clients would be interested in this. And so we did the test where it was like, we literally just forwarded the internal one to clients or to potential clients and be like, hey, I just thought you, would, this is something that we do internally. I just thought you would you find it interesting. And they liked it. And so then we were like, okay, well, let's do more of that. And so it's like the tactics address the question of what do I say? It allows me to be value added with every single interaction where I don't have to, yeah, I don't have to do a lot of the pressury kind of self-serving tactics. So, yeah. I also love the the reminder of moving the free line. So you, you didn't quite say it that way, but you know, this is one of the advantages that, you know, I guess some companies have or realize is that 99% of the stuff that we do is going to be the same as everybody else. It's that final one or nine or 10% that makes the difference. So why not yeah. give away the 90% that's going to help people as much as possible? And if there are, if a lot of people, if again, using the, the different numbers, so we don't get the percentages confused, if 80% of the people are DIYers, then great. Sure. Use the content, do it yourself. But to your earlier point of, you know, your ICP is different to your referral base. Mm -hmm. Eventually, if they have someone who's a friend or a cousin or a brother or uncle who's not a DIYer, who has the same issue, and they're not willing to help them, they're going to, oh, actually, you know, call those guys because that's that's where I essentially stole the playbook from. Yeah, I'm using that playbook. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well, and I think in a lot of cases, like even when, even when the, so many of the things that we do, I mean, like, as you all know, one, there's a really good chance that your client doesn't have the technical expertise to execute the things that you're talking about. And then two, if they do, you have the benefit of the nuance, right? So it's like, I'm giving you the general principle. I'm giving you the quote unquote secret, but there are 20 or 30 down, like micro decisions kind of along the way that you only learn 
from reps and you, you, you know, there's the pattern recognition piece. And I think most clients or potential clients recognize that. And then there's a lot of cases where like, just fundamentally, they can't, it would be extremely, you know, like one of my clients is a, is a law firm, like it would be extremely unwise for somebody to DIY it, even if they, you know, you know, and so it's just like, I think people maybe are worried that their competitors will somehow like steal their insights. And it's like, what are you like, what are you talking about here? Absolutely. Yeah. It's the same stuff. What I, I call this your point of view. So it's like, if you start from the perspective that our, that I, what I sell is at the end of the day, a commoditized service and commoditized doesn't mean millions of people do it, but like even highly specialized things, transfer pricing. There are a lot of firms that do transfer pricing. If your competitive advantage, if you think your competitive advantage is our people are smarter, that's very brittle in my mind. It's very hard to prove and it's probably not true. <laughs> and, and so how do you create differentiation? I think you create differentiation through who you serve. So like the whole idea of like niching down, like we're the best in the world at doing this for healthcare or for fintech or whatever it is. Like that's one. Two is our values. So why we do what we do. So people like to work with people that they like and people where they feel like there's a value fit. And so by communicating the reason, what is my, and this is easier to do certainly with a smaller firm is like, why does this company exist? Like, what is the dent that we seek to make in the universe, so to speak, that like we happen to do transfer pricing, but this is why we do it. Like that's one. And that builds like an emotional connection. The third is like our beliefs about the world. I call this like my unified theory. So it's like, Again, my firm was an innovation consulting firm before, and it was very development focused. So like they wanted to basically compete against startups, you know, bring new kind of products to market. And so we had a lot of point of views around that. So it was like, at the end of the day, did we sell design and development services and like product strategy? We did. But the new, like underneath it was the reason we're different is that we bring a venture lens to it and we bring a startup lens to it, unlike a Deloitte, which can't say that. And so we were like, all right, things like, you need to make a whole bunch of small bets and use portfolio theory to your advantage because any one of these ideas is probably bad, but in aggregate, you're going to find something good. Things like build the smallest possible piece of software as quickly as possible and get it in market so that you can get customer feedback and iterate really, really quickly, which is very antithetical to building large software engagements, which is how most firms are designed and incentivized. And so we're like, no, like, don't do that. That is a mistake. You're going to spend 18 months. You're going to build the thing and find out nobody wants it. Let's find out nobody wants it in three weeks for 20K <laughs> using like low code tools and duct tape, you know, like, so like those were some of our beliefs. And it was like, we have an opinion about the world that this is the right way to do this. And at the end of the day, we're selling the same thing. And then the last one's just like your tone, like your personality. And I think a company can have a personality, but that's one other reason why I believe in all of these, like why LinkedIn is so great why doing the newsletter from the individual partner is so great is like, I think at the end of the day, they're buying from Sean. They're buying from Brendan. They're not buying, like maybe they're, you know, like again, if you're Deloitte and you have that brand, it's different, but for boutique firms, they're buying from you. And so let's inject your personality into this a little bit and like figure out what the event is. Like the company has a brand and you don't want to do things that are, that violate that brand. But within that, you have a wide degree of latitude to inject your personality, you know? Like, oh, I love skiing. And so like, Maybe 10% of your content is about skiing or whatever it is. Like people want to know you as a person. And I think it makes it more likely they want to buy from you. So like if I start from the premise that I'm selling a commodity, I think those are some ways that I can create differentiation that are maybe non-standard, but I think are pretty effective. Right. Really good. Sean, thank you so much. Well, and I guess I prefer snowboarding, but you know. <laughs> That's neither you, here nor there. You get the point. Yeah. We like the same destinations is the important point. That's right. So. As we sort of wrap up here, Sean, is well, there are two things I wanted to make sure I asked. One is if you'd please like share how you'd like people to contact you and if there's anything else you'd like to say around that, like what it is that you're currently doing. And then the other thing would be if you want to leave leave everybody with like one last piece of advice, maybe that we haven't covered yet. Yeah, sure. So first question. So my firm is Madison. We market professional services firms. Right now, the focus is mainly on thought leaders, like helping them articulate that point of view and then communicating that through thought leadership, primarily short form, primarily through the partners directly. Like it's, I'm implementing the playbook for them. And it's really to solve for the problem of like, hey, this is all great. I want to do this. I don't have time. And it's like, okay, like let's, let's help you do that. And we can do that in a scalable way. 
So they hop on a call with us for it's 90 minutes long, once a month. We just get to riff about whatever they're thinking about. And then a week later, we come to the table with a month's worth of content for them that they can push out or we can push out on their behalf. So that's the main thing that we're doing right now. In terms of the thing I want to leave people with, I think it's just, again, like, have a longer time horizon. I'm a big believer in like, I call it the 10-year vision for my life. And I do this at a personal level and I do it at a professional level. It's like, let's stop being in such a hurry. When we do that, I think we operate from, we don't operate from a place of fear. We operate from a place of like abundance and patience. And I have like, there's more than enough work out there for all of us. And if I just show up each day to serve my audience in ways that are respectful and thoughtful and genuinely useful and humble even, it will work. It just, you have to be patient and you have to commit to the process and you have to stick with it over a long-term period of time. But I think you become addicted to it. Like when you start to see it working Mm -hmm. and when you start to see not just your business goals changing, but like having meaningful decade long relationships with the people that you're trying to serve, it becomes self-reinforcing and it makes you want to do more of it. And so that would be my encouragement for people is Almost think of it, I had a mentor that called like differentiated between my job and my work. My job is what I get paid for. My work is the sum of lasting good I create in the world. And so like, if I think about my business development activities as a subset of my work, my body of work I'm creating, I think it redeem. you know, you could have the crappiest boss in the world and it redeems, it redeems your work, you know, and it redeems your job and it just makes you want to show up in a way that I think is much more life-giving and much more joy-filled. Yeah. That's great. What a feel good message. That's really <laughs> awesome. Yeah, really good. And also, it, you know, it reminds me of something that we should probably all remind ourselves of more frequently. And that is we all, you know, grossly overestimate what we can do in one year, but grossly underestimate what we can do in 10 years. Right. Yeah. Again, it's to your point of like taking that long view. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really, really good one. Awesome. Sean, well, thank you so, so much. It was really great getting to know you. No, it's been very enjoyable. Yeah. I look forward to, you know, staying in touch. Did you enjoy this episode? Find more at RevOpsChampions.com.